Welcome back, retrogrades and parish orphans, to Kathmingov weekday three. I've been very excited about this guest also. I know I'm saying this every day of the week, but uh, Stephanie Slade is our guest. Stephanie is the managing editor at Reason Magazine, and I've followed her work for, like all of the guests this week, for uh, years. And Stephanie is an exciting guest to have, particularly in the middle, on the very middle day, of Catholic Minimum Government Week because she, of all of this array on the ideological spectrum of thinkers, she advocates probably the smallest government. Anyway, Stephanie, great to have you on. Thanks for, for joining me today. Sure. Thanks for having me. Yeah, great, great work uh, you're doing there at Reason Magazine. And I want to jump right into the discussion that seems to the right is now beset by it's it's a new discussion and i guess it's what you'd call populism uh pop, populism writ large it's let's go back to a right-wing cultural big government point of view people like you and me and pretty much everyone else that i'm interviewing this week recoil why just walk us through why in term in basic terms I think the schism that's opening up on the right over the last couple of years is really along the fault line of liberalism, not left liberalism, of course, but classical liberal values and institutions that sort of want to protect the individual or protect individual liberty from especially government coercion. That's the schism. I think that for, for decades now, there has been a sort of um, fairly consensus position that conservatives in this country, at least, are also classical liberals. But yeah. now there's this schism opening up, and so you have the what I what I have referred to as the illiberal right, post liberal right, however you want to describe it. Um, people on the other side of the schism who are pushing essentially rejection of that of that consensus, and they say this focus on individual liberty um, was a mistake and it has failed us as conservatives and we need to, we need to embrace a big, powerful central government right. in order to, you know, to sort of reorient society and, and correct, correct these, these mistakes and these flaws. And that uh, the illiberal group the, or the post-liberal group, I think there's a few different camps going on over there. You have your national conservatives, um, yeah. you have your, your common good self-proclaimed common good conservatives. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of overlap between what they're all doing, but what they have in common is is that they want le much less focus on individual liberty and perhaps uh, perhaps the sort of categorical rejection of the sort of conservative belief in individual liberty as the sort of driving one of the animating um, values and a, m a much bigger, um, much sort of more robust embrace of the central government. <laughs> Yeah, they particularly in the Catholic orbit, they say, not wholly incorrectly, that liberalism is the product of you know um, seventeenth uh, and eighteenth century Whigism, you know, namely John Locke. Before John Locke was the Whig philosopher of choice, it was Algernon Sidney who was actually more influential on the founders. My first book, Catholic Republic, is all about how both directly and indirectly the Whigs, particularly the 1600s Whigs, that uh, the neo-Whigs in America across the pond the, the following century were really reading, uh, Algernon Sidney, were all over the place uh, reading and quoting from Robert Bellarmine and Thomas Aquinas a little less directly. And that's where they got all of the classical liberalism from. You don't get it from either the Protestant stream, which the Whigs represent, or the Enlightenment poli stream, which they also represent. It's all there. Madison and Jefferson were had, had Bellarmine marked up in their libraries. And you know who was accused during his life of plagiarizing Bellarmine was Algernon Sidney himself. But more, more convincing, you just can't get classical liberalism from the Protestant, which is the headwaters of the religious right, or the uh, enlightenment headwaters of what we call the secular left. You don't get classical liberalism from either. Now, when in, in Catholic circles, folks move to make a, a critique of classical liberalism. They do so on the basis of saying what I think is really, really a superficial critique and, and nominal. They say, oh, well, there's too much emphasis on individualism. There's not enough emphasis on family, f family, 
familialism or something like that. And it's like, aren't these two terms mostly interchangeable in the, the classical liberal tradition? Don't they stand for the same proposition? Right. I mean, the, the distinction that, that is so important to classical liberals and to me is whether you think a problem should be addressed by through voluntary action or through the coercion, you know, the coercive arm of the state. And ultimately, that's the distinction that I am that I'm drawing out here. I believe that these problems that the, the sort of post liberals may be right to identify, we ought to figure out how to go about solving them, uh, changing the culture if need be. Um, as individuals, as families, as community groups, as churches, as charities, as labor unions, even there's a rich history of, you know, being pro organized labor within the Catholic church. And I think that's a thing that people on the right sometimes don't want to grapple with. Um, but that is all very different from saying that it's the responsibility of the, of the government, of the state, um, and especially the federal government, which is, which fails on, you know, on subsidiarity as well. Yeah. to to solve the problems through co- with coercive means because the state is by its very nature you know the famous definition by Max Weber of what the state is is it's the entity in society with a monopoly on the use of violence it is coercive right. and violent by its very nature we would rather solve problems su- through voluntary means and there are plenty of avenues for going about doing that that don't involve getting the state involved yeah the power to tax is the power to destroy as Scoda said in the middle 20th century and it, it's so true look you, you could I mean, you don't want to jump on my show. We just met and set, start using the royal we, but everything you said, did like double it for me. Like you could you could say we, because that's absolutely my point of view here. You, the, I mean, and pretty much any of the other guests, Father Sirico or, you know, Trent Horn or tomorrow, um, you know, Dr. Samuel Gregg or Robert Riley also. It's Kathmin Gov Week here on Rules for Retrogrades. As everyone knows, my co-host Dave is in transit to his new home, and we're tr- we're literally doing this week, uh, Stephanie, because of what you just said. That the idea needs to get out there. That the coercive arm of the state. We're going to talk about this a little bit later. Do I mean state, uh, capital S or lowercase s? I mean of the government. Um, should be the very very last resort for. Uh, the adjudicative or legislative or executive uh, powers that are associated with doing things that are important to be done in society where they ought to be done is is there. You are, I guess, sui generis. I talked about this with Father Sirico on Monday. You, among all these guests, are sui generis insofar as you're the only one that outright says, we're, we're, we're doing five blades, <laughs> screw it. I am a, a libertarian. I'm not going to mess around with this term conservatarian or a conservative who likes Austrian economics, which is what I say and what most of our other guests say. You say I'm a libertarian and a Catholic. Defend that point of view. I, I don't I don't think it's nearly as hard to defend as as some of our viewers do. But but you do it. Sure. Uh, it, it, the f- it's, it's so important to define our terms. I mean, always, I think, I'm increasingly convinced that in any serious conversation about ideas, everybody should be required to start by defining all their terms because Absolutely. so often the problems are actually, you know, the, the these intractable disagreements are actually semantics. Right. So uh, what am I when I, you know, what do I mean when I say I'm a libertarian? I'm a yeah. small L libertarian. That is to say I'm not in any way affiliated with the libertarian party. I have literally yeah. never voted for a libertarian candidate for any office in my life. So it's not, and Reason Magazine, where I work, is not is not an organ of the Libertarian Party or, or anything like that. Right. Um, I am a uh, a thin libertarian. That means I I don't see this as a comprehensive worldview that tells me everything I de- need to know about how to live a good life. It's just right. a political philosophy. It's a it's a a philosophy that talks about the proper role of the state in society, and and it's one that, as I mentioned, favors you know, minimizing the sort of government coercion and maximizing individual freedom from that government coercion. That's libertarianism. Um, I'm a minarchist. I'm not an anarchist. I'm not advocating doing away with the state entirely. I think my anarchist friends and colleagues have some interesting arguments, but that's not where I'm coming from. Um, And I'm absolutely um, not a libertine. I am not arguing for uh, moral relativism. I'm not arguing for a sort of Ayn Rand style ethical egoism where we're, we should all only do whatever we believe is in our own best interest and we have no moral obligations to each other. I reject that. I think that's wholly incompatible with Christianity. Some libertarians do fall into that camp. Um, there are a lot of different, I mean, libertarianism, despite being a fringe, considered a sort of fringe um, philosophy, 
is a big tent. There are a lot of different ways to be a libertarian. Um, even among yeah. my colleagues at Reason, I have some who fall into the more Randian, you know, atheist, anarchist side. I have me over here as a pro-life, church-going Catholic. Um, the thing that we all have in common is that belief about the proper role of the state, though. That's that, or, or at least, yeah. you know, trying to minimize the authority of the state and maximize individual freedom from government coercion. That's the thing that is, I think, the core. That's what, what's sort of non-negotiable. It's the common ground. And so that's what I'm defending. And that, to me, is very easy to reconcile with Catholicism and Catholic social teaching, I mean, which is essentially built on the idea of the um, universal equal dignity of the human person. That's Catholic social teaching and that's Catholicism. We are made in, you know, in the image of God and therefore we are owed things from each other. Most, you know, first and foremost, the sort of respect and love. Um, and that includes respecting the other's choice, or the, the other's right to make choices for him or herself. That's freedom. That's individual liberty. That's the sort of fairly narrow definition of libertarianism that I just outlined. It's, to me, perfectly compatible with Catholicism. Um, other types of libertarianism are not, like I said. Uh, right. Obje objectivism isn't, libertinism isn't, but that's, I, those, are, those are not central, or, you know, th those are not central to what, the, what it means to be a libertarian for me. No, no. So, I mean, I'm still looking for a way, given your, uh, not, not that I need to alight on it, but I'm still looking for a way, given your definition, to distinguish you from me. I think I might have the one. Um, we'll, we'll do it in a second. But, but like you said, okay, let's, let's go through. I, I published a response to Hadley Arkes, who's, the, I think, the author of the Born Alive legislation, a good, good Catholic thinker who endorsed Vermeule's common good constitutionalism from last month. I was very disappointed. Uh, Dr. Arkees has never met me, doesn't know me. So somewhere away, he, he's feeling uh, critical vibes and, and not knowing the source. Um, but so I, 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 public, I responded with um, an article on textualism and originalism. I'm, I'm as, a, as a jurisprudent, a constitutional scholar, I'm, I'm a robust Scalian originalist. And I was showing how it is utterly compatible with Catholicism and Catholic. Uh, actually, you can't really be a Catholic after Vatican II without uh, uh, a, a textual uh, approach to the sacred constitutions. Um, nevertheless, I think, um, and I've also debated Dr. Patrick Deneen, um on on the Right on Point podcast about you know liberalism writ large. But I think what we need to do is go through, as I do in the article and I show, okay, the four Catholic social doctrines, um, dignity, ra which is the only way as Catholics we're radical egalitarians, uh, the common good, subsidiarity, and solidarity. The two of these, well, really, they get all of them wrong. <laughs> all of this new uh, populist, post-liberal crowd, I don't think they're ever liberals, because they say liberalism was wrong from the outset, ab initio. Nevertheless, I don't think they ever embrace the, the true conception of the common good, which they think just means the state like a leviathan swallowing everything up, or solidarity, right? The way that it's misdefined often, solidarity sounds like it's just the opposite of subsidiarity. Subsidiarity is, you know, the local orbit always gets right of first refusal. So the family, the fa you know, household father, according to Leo the Thirteenth. Pius XI, should be the main adjudicator of morals, um, and literally the only thing that passes to city government would be that which he can't competently adjudicate or legislate. And same thing, city government vis-a-vis -vis state government, same thing, state government for the national government gets the last thing. It only gets the, you know, barely warmed over leftovers. Uh, these new post-liberals following Deneen and Vermeule, they say, well, solidarity means that which unites us all, right? And, and, and the common good is the telos, the purpose of the Catholic social architectonic. And they basically require big government, a combination of solidarity between all of us, you living on the East Coast or whatever, three, three time zones away, me living on the West Coast. What's the only thing that can unite us in solidarity nationally toward the common good? Well, it's got to be big government. They, they basically ignore subsidiarity. That's a completely wrong way to approach it. Pius XI says subsidiarity is inviolable at all times. That doesn't mean that something never passes to the central government. 
war powers would, but that's only because it's not competent at the lower level. So what do you say about subsidiarity and what they say about the common good and solidarity? Uh, I mean, what's the reply? Yeah, I mean, I would agree with everything you just said. It, it's, it's actually hard to argue the things they are arguing while keeping subsidiarity in mind. Um, it, this, this sort of draws out the importance of the point that they do not have a monopoly on concern for the common good. In fact, right. any good Catholic must. And I have written, I, I wrote a piece for America Magazine, a Jesuit magazine, three years ago on libertarianism and the common good. Um, next month, I'm giving a presentation virtually to the Acton Institute's um, big summer conference on the same topic, libertarianism and, and the common good. I am very concerned by the common good. They do not have a monopoly on this. And right. what we are arguing about is how, you know, what does it mean and how to go about uh, sort of supporting and, and achieving it. And I feel very good about my arguments for why, you know, their sort of big government, big central federal government um, agenda and and sort of also sort of trashing of the constitution along the way in some cases um is the wrong way to achieve the thing that we all say we want to do yeah yeah no i mean it's so november of last year marco rubio got jumped on to the bandwagon right and he started using this term common good uh capitalism now, Adrian Vermeule published last month this article that set everything on the internet on fire, common good, constitutionalism. They talk, Stephanie, as if they do have a monopoly on the common good. Why don't they in, in, in you know, a few lines? Well, I mean, the common good is defined by the Catholic Church in the Catechism as the, the set of conditions that allow individuals and groups to reach their full human flourishing, something like that. That's a slight paraphrase. Um, what are those conditions? And, and so it's, it's things that are shared among everybody, like peace and justice and material abundance. Um, I think one of those things has to be a general presumption of liberty. We are not, nobody is going to reach their, their, mature, their, their sort of total human flourishing if they don't, for example, have religious freedom to pursue the good and the truth and their, their relationship with their God um, right. to the best of their ability. If they're, if they're constrained by the, by the state and, and prevented from worshiping and uh, following their conscience, that's, there's there's a, a hard cap on the ability for us to reach the common good in that case. Um, same thing with uh, if you're talking about how do you achieve justice and how do you achieve material abundance. I think we have seen that the sort of institutions of free markets and um, glo you know, global trade are conducive to the things that we are all in agreement we're trying to achieve. So it's both a moral case. Freedom is itself a component of the common good. Without it, um, you know, without it, you, you cannot achieve, you cannot sort of reach the highest good, which is union with God. And freedom is a means to an end of some of these other things that we believe are important components of the common good, such as material well-being. It's, it's, it's very easy to make that argument, actually. And, and, you know, as you pointed out, Catholics for generations have done, have done so, going back to the Salamanca school. And, um, it, it, it's not, it's not a sort of, um, uh, absurd or ra even radical position to take that that we should be that we as Catholics who have the common good in sight need to be also need to need to simultaneously be sort of staunch defenders of individual freedoms um, along the way, which is not the same thing as saying that we are. That there's a tendency among some people like Sora Bamari and others to refuse to use the word freedom or liberty and instead to only talk about quote radical autonomy. Right. And, and what they mean by that is everything that is that is bad about individualism without me actually defining what I what my, without me defining my terms. Right. So you're defending is individual Agreed. liberty, and I don't know what they mean by autonomy, but I don't think it's what I'm talking about. Um, Agreed. Which is why I think they need to introduce this other word for some you know to sort of obfuscate the point. Yeah. Well said. Very well said. I I mean I last summer around before running up to the Amari French debate on transgender reading hour. I, I sent him a book and we were DMing some and I was, I, I tried to say what you just said. I can't remember how it actually came across. Uh, Viz, you're just using individualism as a four letter word and, and saying that because I, I don't agree with everything David French says, uh, far be it from me to do that. But um, individualism, you're just picking it in its most um, I would say in a really tendentious way, you're, you're, you're picking it in its m absolutely most uh, licentious 
uh, libertinistic iteration. And it, it's clear what you're doing. You're, you're just, it's called a straw man. Um, why not steel man individualism where it were really the basic unit, the single cell of society, according to the catechism is family. And that's really where we're socialized. We're not socialized in nanny public school, you know, garbage classrooms or whatever. We're socialized in the family. It's more clear if you, you come from big families that that's really the, the uh, proving ground of socialization. But uh, individualism means the family. I, I was just saying, come on, man, it means the family. You're, you're being really superficial when you take individualism to mean uh, licentiousness. Now, you, it, this did not, Stephanie, this did not begin with the Solomonkins. They are, the Solomonkins are being perfectly good, not even particularly original Catholic thinkers. They're, they're good Thomists. You know, Thomas Aquinas is... Not all virtue must be uh, mandated. Not all vice must be uh, proscribed. And pretty much everything in questions 92 to 100, what we call the treatise on law, is what you would what you would hope to see. And Pope Leo the Thirteenth, in Rerum Novarum, is just taking he's taking from Thomas more than he he's even taking from guys like uh, Bellarmine or Suarez or Mariana, and even going back to Aristotle, Book Five of the Nicomachean Ethics. He's working out that really we don't need morals regulated, particularly not from the very top. We don't need them all regulated, even though he says in books one and two that because he's an ancient thinker that, that that's sort of his received opinion. He's working it out through the book. W.D. Ross said this, the great Aristotle scholar. He's working it out as he works through the Nicomachean Ethics. And by book five, the, the birthplace of, of natural law, um, codified in philosophy, some say, Aristotle's getting to this idea that that uh, the good man and the good citizens will not at all times be the same guy. I don't know why Amari and, and types like Deneen and Vermeule, I don't know why they can't get this or don't want to get it. What is it? Yeah, I, I mean, I don't know. I think uh, regulation is another one of these slippery words that it helps. It, it does a lot of work if you define it up front um, and get them to define up front. You know, do, do, do morals need to be regulated? Yes, absolutely. We we have to form our consciences. We have an obligation to to study and to pray and to uh, receive you know receive the revelation and to learn from the learn from it. And um, we are regulated by our families, as you mentioned, and by other sort of societal institutions, civil society institutions. Um, we are all regulated. And, and also, we regulate the market by the choices we make. If you've ever chosen to not work on the weekend and instead spend that time with your family, even though you could make some extra money if you worked on the weekend, you have, you have sort of regulated, you, your morals have had a regulatory effect on the market. So what... Yeah. what the distinction has to be, are you talking about regulation in any of those ways, or are you specifically calling for coercive government top-down regulation? And that's the thing that we're against. Everything else, we can we can debate the prudence of any of those other things, but the, 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 the hard line for me is if you're calling for coercion, you know, the, the, the arm of the state to be brought in to force people to, to um, or, or to regulate by force, then I have a problem, and then I think you've crossed over into, onto the sort of wrong side of the illiberal schism. Agreed. Uh, uh, you know, w that's absolutely right. When we talk about um, even an ancient thinker like Aristotle, who's, who's really the headwaters for all these great thinkers that we we're mentioning, he admit this is why he crosses over, in, and in book five he's like, no, there has to be a distinction between good man and good citizen, moral man and, and good citizen, because... His system, his rigorous system of ethics, where there's accidental virtue, where you, you do the right thing, but it's either new because not habituated and not pleasurable. Because um, when you have the true version of that virtue, wh whichever virtue we're talking about, um, you will receive natural pleasure from doing it, it itself. Pleasure's the test, as Aristotle says. So give to the poor, right? Um, there are literally four modes of, of existence with regard to uh, liberality, giving to the poor. There's pure vice, where you don't know it. You don't even know that that's a thing that people give to the poor. And you don't do it. And therefore, you receive pleasure from holding on to your money like a greedy person, being a greedy person. But then there's the next stage called incontinence, where you, you see a friend give to the poor once and you're like what are you doing and they're like well this is what i'm doing here's why 
and and it troubles you. And you can you keep doing the wrong thing on Sunday or whatever at at, at church or when you pass um, a homeless person on the street. You hold on to your money, but it does pain you now. You're no longer in pure vice. You're now in incontinence. Your your will is incontinent. You kind of know you should do it, and it's been growing on your mind. Then there's the dotted line, existential line in the sand for Aristotle, where you're like, I'm going to try doing what my friend Bob did that one time. I'm going to try giving this $5 bill to that bum or whatever. And you do it, but it gives you immediate pain, right? And it's brand new. You haven't habituated it. Uh, so now you're you're the opposite of incontinent. You're continent. You you do before. Whereas when you're con- incontinent, you do the wrong thing and it pains you. Now you're doing the right thing or you're trying it, but it's unhabituated and therefore it's it's in your intellect but not your will. So doing the right thing pains you. Do it a hundred times under the right disposition, time, 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 and you'll get used to it. Eventually, you'll come to true virtue. So you have true virtue. Uh, continence, incontinence, true vice. The reason this is all so important is it, it means that Deneen, Amari, Vermeul, et al., because we we are Aristotelians in our ethics as Catholics, it's not debatable. We are virtue ethicists. That's that's just simply not debatable after you know our bimillennial Catholic tradition. It means that the government has only the power, and Aristotle says this in Book Five, to through through forced regulation, right? Uh, virtue modeling at the at the point of a bayonet. The most they can cultivate in the populace is accidental virtue, because you're you're, you're commandeering the will of that person. Instead, it's supposed to be the person's intellect that gets them to do it in the right place, and then through habituation the virtuous thing moves from their intellect into their will. That's that's how you make a, a virtue for Roman Catholicism. It's not debatable. And laws, at the most, yeah, they can protect us from the worst men, and they can set mediocre men on the path toward virtue, but they can never bring them all the way. That's the moral argument for minarchism, or whatever you want to, whether you call it conservatarianism or libertarianism or just straight-up conservatism, minimal government, that's it. That's why, I mean, like, all your arguments are great, but this is, for these Catholic guys, these Catholic professors out there that are flirting with despotism from the top, you, this is why you can't do it. It's not an open debate. The, the then, laws... We need, they need to keep in mind that it gets, has gotten lost, surprisingly, because all during the Obama years, for example, there were a, a whole series of attacks from the state on people of faith. Uh, uh, so the contraception mandate, trying to force Catholic nuns to pay for birth control, um, this sort of move not just to um, legalize civil gay marriage, but to require wedding vendors to participate in, in gay wedding um, celebrations, things like that. There, um, there's, a, there's a whole, I mean, I spent my, those years writing about all of these, um, these instances and making the case for why the government was was violating religious liberty and um, why religious liberty is important. Um, that I was writing from a liberal perspective. I was making the liberal case for getting the government out and for the government to do its job by by um, by carving out and protecting the public square and not allowing one sect within society to impose its will by force on another. If right. uh, if you want to try to to um, you know, make the case for why your employer should cover your birth control. You are you are more than well willing to do that. Or you're, you're you're within the sort of liberal framework. You have every right to do that. If you want to quit your job and go work for somebody else because that one employer wouldn't pay for your birth control and another one will, you have every right to do that. I mean, if you want to organize a boycott, you have every right to do that within the liberal framework. What you don't have the right to do is to um, impose your view on the other side by the force of the state. So. Right. So the the sort of very important thing here is that the, the state actually does have an a sort of an obligation to keep one set of one you know when you have differing factions in society to keep anybody from imposing their views on the others through actual coercion through through putting a gun to your head or whatever the state has to protect us it has to protect our individual liberties um, and it has to refrain from taking the sides of one of those factions and, you know, ganging up on everybody else. And it, it doesn't always do that. It didn't, it didn't do that on quite a few occasions during the Obama years, for example. Um, but ultimately, there were a lot of ways that, like, the liberal institutions fought back against it. So, um, so you know, when, right. David, when David French 
launches a lawsuit against a university because that university is not allowing a, the pro-life student club to use me, you know, the meeting space on campus. He's using the liberal institutions and liberal values and making a liberal-based argument for, on behalf of the sort of religious traditional um, rights. It, that it's there's it's it's self-correcting is my point. If you if you stay true to liberalism, it corrects itself. It it sort of prevents the worst successes of any side from from taking over. If you abandon those liberal values and institutions, then you it just becomes a situation of might makes right, and whoever happens to have the you know reins of power at any given time right. um, can 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 control everybody else, which is not necessarily going to be good for anybody. Right. It's not going to be good for us. You know, there's no guarantee that it's going to be good for us. That's that's the sort of pragmatic response to the to that that crowd. Yeah, and that crowd always assumes, as Father Robert Sirico said on Monday, that they are going to be head of the Politburo. Why do you assume that? Why do you always? When I'm doing a monthly budget, I don't assume like hyper optimal conditions, right? I don't assume. Oh, yeah, I, I'm probably going to win the lottery on the second of the month, right? I mean, who figures that way? The uh, the post-lib crowd on the so on the right, I guess, if you call them the right anymore, uh, that want big government, they're always assuming that they are the, the chairman of the Politburo. And it's it's absurd. Why assume that? We've always lost, we Catholics, we've always lost from, you know, Nero to FDR or Nero to Obama. We always lose when the uh, state starts adjudicating m- immorals really is what they're doing but here's where i'd push back a little study i am not everyone already knows this uh in rules for retrogrades crowd in rules for retrogrades land i'm not an integralist i'm not but like what do you what do you say to this i'm not sure if this is pushing back or just uh, interrogating uh one point that i heard in what you said last because everything else you've said on the entire show 100 percent agreement Eight of the original 13 states had state establishments of religion. And, you know, in the southern states, it was Anglicanism. In the northern states, it was the, the covenant tradition. Um, the, fir- the meaning of the First Amendment was reversed in 1946, uh, Everson versus Board of Ed. Um, they literally, the, the court self-consciously, with seven of nine justices being open Freemasons, they said, we are reversing the meaning of of separation of church and state, which is not not in the First Amendment, nowhere in the Constitution. It appears in an 1801 letter from Jefferson to the Danbury Baptist Association. But we're reversing the meaning of separation, which to this point has accrued to the credit of uh, religion, you know, separating uh, the state from religion to protect religion. In 1946, in the Masonic era of the court up to now, it means protecting the state from religion. I, I might have said it wrong before. Religion from the state protection before, state from the religion protection up to today, from the uh, post-war period. And, and the proof of this, what I always say to Catholics that are like integralists, they're like the uh, United States was founded by, by Masons, I'm like, not true. This is a smoking gun. The fact that these Masons, and, and mostly Protestants, um, uh, hardwired in 1791, the First Amendment, that said, you know, in, up until the 14th Amendment, which incorporated the Bill of Rights against state legislatures as well as Congress, it wasn't meant that way. Congress wasn't allowed to come up with a national religion, but the states were and did, more than half of them, have state establishments of Protestantism. I wish, you know, Maryland or something at least was a Catholic state at the level of uh, localism, local experimentation. Um, you know, it would be cool if one or more of the states were Catholic, but that's not the point. That is a kind of American integralism. It shocks the integralist crowd. They never know what to say when I throw that at them. It's a real historical fact. What do you say there? Because, see, I, I, don't, I, don't think, I don't think the state need. I'm not an integralist. I'm an anti-integralist. But I don't think the state needs to be neutral to Islam, which wants to, if, if you read the Quran for what it really is, wants to cut off all of our heads, and Catholicism, the one true faith. I guess I don't really understand. So not arguing from a sort of either a historical or a constitutional perspective, but from a moral perspective based on our shared, you know, the values that we just spent the last you know, 40 minutes outlining, I don't really understand why you would reject integralism or, a, or an a integration of um, 
religion and the state at the federal level, but not at the state level. I mean, if it wouldn't, couldn't I come in whatever arguments you use to say it should be established in Maryland, but not at the federal government, whatever arguments you use, couldn't I say, well, why can't it be at Tosa in Maryland? We have an, we have an establishment, but not at the state of Maryland. Why shouldn't it be at a lower level than the state? I don't see any argument for why the state is the right level. I mean, if anything, you're falling into the same trap that the, the nationalists make when they say, well, the national government is the thing that matters, and we need to we need to bulk up the power of the national government to protect it against the influence of these supranational, you know, governing institutions like the UN or whatever. Okay, the UN are, is a problem. I'm, I'm willing to, like, go along with your arguments here. Why are we going to devolve power only as far as the nation and not keep going? And the same thing, I would put the same question to you. Why would we devolve... Why would we allow an establishment of religion at the state level, um, which then would, would would sort of, you have your laboratories of democracy happening at you know at the fifty state level, but why not at the county level? Why not at the at the neighborhood level? Why would you why would you sort of cap it there? Why is that okay? And I, I don't you know I'm not going to defend. Of course I'm not going to defend every um, all the ways that our norms have evolved over the course of American history. Um, there are many things about the sort of post-sexual revolution era that, that we live in that I don't like and uh, that I would like to see changed. But I think the norm that says that we don't have an establishment of religion at the state level, um, I support that. I think that was the, I think we are in a sort of Hayekian or even Chestertonian way. We are always feeling our way out to better arrangements of society and that this one was the right call. We, we have found that, especially as this country has become ever more diverse, you know, so we're not we're not just a Protestant country anymore. We now have 20% of us are Catholic. We have a small but growing, you know, um, minority of, of Muslims and other people from other groups and other religious backgrounds. Um, the, the, the sort of moral arguments and the, the sort of prudential arguments, pragmatic arguments in favor of um, trying to have the government be as neutral as possible, I think are very strong. And they're strong at the state level, just like they're strong at the national level. This, oh, okay, so let, let's 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 interrogate that for a second because we we found probably the one way we disagree. The answer to the question is sovereignty, right? So when the Constitution was ratified, now I want to define what it means for a document to be ratified. It means that someone present besides the authors is giving uh, their agency, signing over their agency, and when they're when they're representatives at a ratifying convention. A ratifier it represents his entire constituency. So they become authors with the author. Um, so the several people of the several states are represented and by, by states. We here we mean actually the typical definition, the 50 states rather than the, the government writ large. The states are where sovereignty is supposed to reside. We have the system of federalism, right? Um, I, I know you know that, so I'm just uh, doing a little review for, for the audience here. Federalism means two levels of government, national and state. Something like uh, drag queen reading hour, I'm a libertarian at the national level because it's a trustworthy assumption that there's so little adjudicating power for the national government that it could never be something moralish like outlawing drag queen reading hour. But at the state level, when I'm a constitutionalist, and why am I constitutionalist? Because of subsidiarity. The 50 states, the four of experimentation, they're the ones that the 10th Amendment, the most conservative amendment in the Constitution, more than the second even, says uh, the states have this residual police power to, to make laws on issues that the federal government should never touch on health, safety, welfare, morals, security. So um, it's true that I think, like you're insinuating, Stephanie, some states are the size of countries, right? I mean, California, Texas, New York, Alaska, you know, if we're not going by population, are like large countries in Europe. And that's probably not local enough. I'll give you that concession, that, that there's not, there's state sovereignty there, but that's more like national sovereignty at the state level because the state's so large. And I do agree, if that's what you're insinuating, um, you said it with your eyes. That's a problem. But with the sm with small states, particularly ones that um, Mont Montesquieu uh, ha has in mind and Locke has in mind as the size uh, is a proper size of uh, adjudicating the sovereignty of uh, people being represented. Um, 
The number one rule is that that it should be small and that the people should be univocal. So the the pro my one problem with the Constitution is that it's the first um, exercise of republicanism, small r, that sees largely because of James Madison and James Wilson, a body of interests, pluralistic interests, being represented, and none of the guys that we said support our claim against the the nationalists like Aristotle. Uh, Augustine, Thomas, the Salamancans, uh, Montesquieu, any of these classical theorists, they all say republics have to be small and sort of one-voiced. So not the size of the United States, that's a continent, right? Not even the size of Texas, more like the size of Delaware or West Virginia. And they should represent one interest. The states can gather together as a League of Nations because sovereignty. If I don't like that Delaware, my state, makes a, makes the this established religion uh, Protestantism, some sect of Protestantism, which I wouldn't like. Then I'm going to look for a, a nearing a neighboring state that, uh, and this is realistic too, that that favors Catholicism, where there's an establishment of Catholicism. The we are new in terms of republics that are trying to be pluralistic. I think that's where the rot and the creep has. Um, you know, the smoke of Satan, as Paul VI said, has entered, is the fact that we're trying to do republics that are pluralistic. That doesn't mean we can't tolerate others. In in-state establishments, uh, those eight states I referred to, didn't mean you couldn't live there. Didn't even mean there's something like a Islamic jizya, which is that attacks on, you know, other people of the book, that, that really you can get killed if you don't pay it. It just means literally um, the, st the, the niceties of the state establishment don't accrue in your favor. I don't think it's going far enough to say, I mean, what you said about federalism and two levels of government, those are constitutional arguments. What I'm talking about, I, I think that, that, that that's fine. You can make that constitutional argument. It's a historical argument in the case of the United States. I think it fails on subsidiarity because there are many lower levels still of government that you could devolve power to besides the state. So I think you fail. I mean, you're at best a partial subsidiaritist at that point, and that's not good enough for me. Um, and also, I, I think at a, at a practical level, again, when it comes to making prudential judgments about where should we, where should we place the power, where should we want the power to, to make these calls to be, um, yeah, Texas is a big state and Rhode Island is a small one, but your system would have the people of Syracuse and Rochester at uh, the mercy of the people of Manhattan. I mean, that's the system that you just described is one in which the morals are governed by Manhattanites and the people in Rochester have no say in the matter. Um, I mean, they have a say, they can vote, but they're going to lose because they're, they're a minority of the, of the state. And that is, again, that is not good enough for me when it comes to um, achieving that aspect of the common good that we've been talking about, that is maximizing, you know, human freedom from coercion. I want us to devolve much farther than the state level. Um, at, at the like township level, I start to become a little bit more sympathetic to the argument. If you want to have an establishment of religion in your township, in rural New York, um, I don't. I'm. I'm. I bristle in, uh, instinctively at that, but I can start to see the case. Um, we're getting very, very close to the individual and the family at that point. Um, but the state level, even for some of the thirteen original colonies, you know, the state of New York is huge and was all, always diverse and is ever so now. I agree. But uh, and it, it something's to be said for the fact that when Aristotle, the headwaters of all this is lining it out, he has the city state in mind. But where but the reason that remember subsidiarity plays with solidarity, not not the the perverted iteration that guys like Amari and Vermeule are playing with. Real subsidy, uh, real solidarity is subsidiarian, and this means that it works in the direction of one common good, which is not, as you said at the beginning, it's not just freedom, right? Ordered freedom is liberty, non-ordered freedom is license. So we do have to acknowledge, again, not an integralist, but we have to acknowledge um, a univocity of interest. And it, it can't, I don't think it can, I, it just can't be done with all the, the, the religions out there. That doesn't mean they can't coexist, but they can't be a part of the, uh, uh, the the regime has to be shaped around a common good as defined by a party that's not neutral. And um, the, the republic means res publica. It only works 
this is the only way to conceive of republics in a in a way that's consistent with the Catholic tradition. There has to be a res publica, one thing we all have in mind. That's fine to label it a, the common good, but the common good's a stalking horse and nothing more, unless we actually give flesh it out some. And we say, okay, well, you know, a Satanist can certainly live in the United States of Jeffersonia or something like that, you know, the 51st state. But his law, the laws are not neutral with regard to this Satanist and this Roman Catholic. The laws will, 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 uh, will I'd say, semi-neutrally favor the Catholic insofar as it's, it's a presumption or a presupposition of, be concrete, you know, though. What does that mean? What in what ways does the law favor the Catholic over the Satanist? At a, at the state level, something like um, a, a abortion laws, um, um, the, the the rules on hospitals on forced contraception. You have to. There has there is no such thing as real neutrality there, right? The hosp I don't want hospital administrators making this call. That that um, let's put it this way. To be real here. Uh, if the state is neutral, it always winds up, even in non-liberal states, and this is because subsidiarity has been perverted, it always ends up favoring abortion laws. Like, you agree, right? It, it always ends up going against us. We're not the head of the Politburo. No, I disagree, actually. Um, in fact, I wrote a major investigative piece for America Magazine, again, about three or four years ago, in which I talked about the flurry of lawsuits that the ACLU has for years been launching against Catholic hospitals and Catholic hospital systems and the U.S. Confl uh, Conference of Catholic Bishops because they sort of exercise oversight over Catholic hospitals in which they have tried repeatedly to get the government to say that women have a right to um, abortion, sterilization, elective sterilization procedures, uh, also that people have a right to, uh, what do they call the transgender, like gender confirming therapies and surgeries um, for, tra for trans people. They want Catholic hospitals to be coerced by the state to have to do these things. And every single time, the ACLU has lost. And they have launched dozens, if not hundreds, of these lawsuits. And they lose every time. So it is not the case that our, that our sort of um, institutions that, take a, that sort of uh, approach these, adjudicating these questions with, with liberal norms in mind always favor the other side. In fact, they... I think rightly applied, they will always have to lose those, those uh, liberalism will always come down on the side of the private hospital having the right to do whatever the hell it wants within its own walls, right? So, and you having the right to decide whether to go there or somewhere else. That is liberalism. It is, it is actually in that sense neutral. And what you're describing uh, would be, would be, uh, you're falling into the same trap that the leftists fall into, which is they say it's not, um, it's, you know, it's, it's not neutral if they're allowed to do something I don't like. Yes, it is actually. That is that is the whole point of the sort of individual liberty that we're defending. They no, but have the value right, have the right. Value neutralism. Here's all I'm saying. I think I stated it badly. Value neutralism is a vacuum, right? It, it will be rushed in. You can't you can't make that argument when Roe versus Wade is is nationalized. Um, you can't make the argument even even if if it weren't nationalized, if uh, if the fundamental uh, e even the the broad kind of um, ecumenical conception of the common good, you know, that, that even an, an agnostic would accept, like protecting life, liberty, property, or something like that. If that's what it is, at the levels of the state, and I know I'm going into Civil War type arguments here, 14th Amendment arguments, what about the states among those 50? If we overturn Roe versus Wade, and the state, and there are 20 states or so, maybe 30 are anti-abortion, 20 are pro-abortion, it doesn't suffice at some level. It just doesn't suffice morally to be even in the loose kind of confederation that I'd argue the Constitution uh, mandates for those 30 states with 20 states that are doing state allowed, you know, infanticide or you know, whatever we think at some level. And I, I'm not saying it even needs to be national. I'm arguing for a robust. I'm arguing for a subtle uh, non-neutrality at the at the state level, you know. So, th and that's the only way you're going to get it. How do you ever address as a person? This is a big, big philosophical question. Working federalism, we're in a loose confederation with people in the other states, maybe somewhere in, in on the scale of looseness between the Articles of Confederation and the Constitution, um, where the Constitution's too tight a confederation, the the Articles were too loose. 
we still bear some moral agency for being in a Republican small R type of league with uh, 20 states that that where abortion is the law of the land um, that there is no res publica, the common good, however ecumenical you want to define it, if we're not protecting like right number one, the right to life. And unless and you can't do it at the national, I, I, I don't favor doing it at the national level. Right. I, I, so what are you saying? You that to- If you don't favor doing it at the national level, but you also think it's unacceptable or intolerable to be a member of a republic where some percentage of the states legalize it. What are you saying? What I'm saying is so it, all 50 of the states should be where we're talking philosophically about what should be encouraged at the level of the police power of the state. And and you have to do it 50 times is because this is, it's sort of a dumb hypothetical, but except you'd have to do it 50 times. And I would just say when it comes to the adjudicating power of states, the police power, I'm an originalist. Yes. Some of the states are too big. That's fine. If we balkanize them. But at that level where the real moral authority rests, in the, in the United States, the moral authority is supposed to rest with state legislatures, not the Congress. Break up the big states so it's more local. I like that. We shouldn't feign value neutrality, lest there be one state out of 50 even where abortion is legal. And since we neither of us want to do it at the national level, I'm, I'm asking you, without a, a robust conception of the common good in the res publica, how do we how would you ever address it with the one or two remnant states that that hold on to abortion even after it's de- denationalized with bro well you have to do it through persuasion pressure and persuasion i mean what you what you started with you know you went kind of fast past this but you said there is a conception of the common good that basically everybody agrees upon. For example, life, liberty, property. I talked earlier about um, peace, justice, and material abundance. These are sort of big. Um, they're common goods. They're, they're aspects of the common good, right? They're things that you need to go back to the catechism's definition. They're conditions um, that are required for humans to reach their their flourishing and their fulfillment. Um, you need all these things. And I add, I add like individual liberty in terms of like religious freedom and that sort of thing to, to, to the mix as well. Um, the things that are accepted by everybody are accepted by everybody. And if we, if we, if we can agree that there are some things that are aspects of the common good that there's no disagreement about, basically, or there's essentially unanimity, um, then all we have to do is talk about definitions. And we have to talk about how do we achieve, how do we achieve or accomplish those things. And so Agreed. I did, I wrote a, a piece years ago um, explaining how I can be a pro-life libertarian in which I said, listen, you have to answer the question of when does human life begin? What is personhood? And, um, you know, once you answer that question and wh- whether the act of an abortion is an act involving one human being or two, that's the question. Libertarianism sure. doesn't give you the answer to that question. You, we have to make the case for why, why our, you know, our perspective on this is the one that accords with the truth. Um, and, and if once we do that, though, libertarianism and, um, and liberalism says, yeah, the state should protect that. that once state, we're all in agreement that the state should exist to protect human, you know, innocent human life. So all we have to do is argue about what does that mean? How do we define life? And I think we're right. I think we have truth on our side. And so I'm hopeful that we will eventually win this argument. But I don't see how there is any alternative other than top-down national policy to having that argument out at, at the level... I mean, at whatever level you think that the ban should exist, I, I don't disagree with you that it should exist probably at the Yeah, state. no, I know. I know. Because I believe that the state exists to protect life. And, you know, that's the, that's the primary purpose of the state. So we're not, we're not disagreeing. Nobody's really disagreeing about that question. We're disagreeing about, you know, what is abortion? What is, when does human life begin? And there, any alternative to persuasion of the, of the body politic, any alternative, I, I have argued this several times, is by definition tyranny. If if a minority tries to impose its view on a majority against its will, that is tyranny by definition. So we have to persuade people in in the state in question. Well, see, Whether, yeah, it's it's unfortunate that that we started you to flesh out the hypo. We went to abortion because we're both a hundred percent anti-abortion, and also it's a, a infinitesimally small detail, you know, in terms of uh, Republican theory. And the way that federalism operates that that we're 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 banding about now, but it is the one that that uh, we the one thing we probably disagree on. I told Saurabh Amari when he's debating David French, David, you know, Saurabh's saying outlaw drag queen reading hour at the national level. David French is saying no, we just we're just stuck with it. 
And I was saying, well, no, in, in the system of um, Imperium in Imperio comes really from Magna Carta. You know, you can have an empire within an empire. To Federalism was not made up by James Wilson and James Madison. It comes from the robust Catholic tradition in forming Magna Carta, which itself was formed by the, Arist the early Aristotelians. And I'm saying, yeah, it's great. Uh, I agree with, with one critique you made, that, that some states are far too big for us to really call it subsidiarity. Texas, if you're driving across the country, you spend a full day driving through Texas. Not subsidiarian enough. Fair critique. But whatever, whatever level the sovereignty really exists at, at a legislative level, it has to exist somewhere, or, or else it is, it is so, anarchism. This is the whole but, debate we're having. And, and you began by saying that the family should begin by adjudicating moral issues, and only if they're incompetent to do so should it move on to, let's say, the local government and then the state government and the national government. Correct. And my question to you is, in what way is the family not... Uh, competent to say, I'm going to not take my kids to Drag Queen Story Hour. So it's you're doing clear to me that 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 this problem is already solved at the individual level, and we do it's, not need a state involvement to begin with. You're 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 talking about is the family competent at, a priori? I'm saying there's an element of the, the question: Is the family competent to adjudicate this a posteriori? Uh, meaning, with uh, with applied to the facts, I'll tell you whether the family in a state like New York or my state, California or Massachusetts, I'll tell you whether those families as as um, as a, an aggregation of the sovereign will of those states are competent to adjudicate whether or not to murder their babies. No, they're, they're not. I noticed, I noticed you just stopped talking about Drag Queen Story Hour and went to the far more inflammatory issue of abortion. I would like to press okay, you push it back Drag to, Queen Story Push Hour. it back to Drag Queen Story Hour. In a state like uh, Massachusetts, New York, California, are they competent to, well, no, there is a distinction there. That's why um, there's a distinction between like a, a human rights violation, right? Where you're get, with, with abortion, we're both anti-abortion. And th that's why I was trying to move away from it because I didn't want people to get mixed up. Um, with abortion, I'd say it's sui generis where you say, we're going to apply an a posteriori um, as the facts apply to it, question of whether or not uh, whether or not the the localist level family is competent to adjudicate. In that case, since it's such a basic right, the right to life, the most fundamental iteration of the res publica's goal, the common good, you're not even protecting the rights to life. Millions of babies are being killed on behalf of the state wherever there's a state, even in a post Roe versus Wade world. Hypothetically, uh, that puts it back to the states. Are families in pro-abortion states competent to make this choice? No. At some level, the state has to, on some authority, on some legal theory, defend the kids. But but I'd say that's that's sui generis. That's abortion. You, might you have yet to make an argument for why the state has the right to ban a drag queen story hour, though. A state yeah, government. Drag queen story hour, I would shift to an a priori. Is, are families in general competent to to take their um, to take their kids to make the decision to take their kids to Drag Queen Story Hour? And I, and I agree with you. At this, and I, I've I've argued this. I wrote two articles on it. At the state level, this is where it could be. We don't want it banned at the the national level. At the state level, yes, go ahead and and ban it. I mean, it's a question between a priori and a, a posteriori competence. Um, yeah. What do you say to that? It sounds to me like what you're saying is, and I agree with you, at the family level, a family shouldn't have the right to choose abortion. That's not, like, they we don't, let, we don't let them have the choice because, because there's not two options that they, where they have a right to both of them. Um, when it comes to a family deciding whether to take the kid to Drag Queen Story Hour, um, do you see that as equivalent? And I just don't. I don't see that as equivalent, where some families might make a choice that you don't agree with, that you wouldn't mimic, um, that you don't like, that you might argue against, you might write an article for why it's a bad idea, you might even pick it outside of the library. But do you have the right to intervene by force and prevent them from making that choice that you don't like? For abortion, I say yes. For drag queen story hour, I say hell no. You don't have that right to intervene. It depends how, I mean, this is where if, if the, the, the Catholic social teaching is correct. I, I think what I advocated um, last summer on, uh, I'm, I'm trying to remember where I wrote this, and what I was telling Sarah Bamari, 
Nationally, no, you can't adjudicate it. Constitutionally, Tenth Amendment, yes, absolutely. The the state has the the uh, the moral power, health, safety, welfare. More. I mean, I didn't make up the police power of the state. I wouldn't say that it's imperative in the same way that each of the states adjudicates this, which would actually drive the the uh, the sovereign power back national, which is what we kind of. I guess are both admitting you you do at some level with murdering uh, the most defenseless in society. I I agree with you that there's a distinction to be made. And this is a real real uh, delicate question, but I have I would have no problem. I, I would argue I would vote in my state. This is what I was saying. It's kind of in between positions. I would vote in my state to outlaw uh, drag queen story hour, right? And if my state were California, which it is. And I were the minority, I would think I need to get to a polity, you know, a nearby state where I'm more, uh, where where the concept of res publica is more apt to fit, meaning I'm like my neighbors, right? We hold, uh, they might not all be Catholic, but they're at least conservative Protestants who hold uh, the, the baseline values, like, hey, Drag Queen Story Hour is really going to pervert uh, a young mind. It's, it's not murdering someone, but it could, it could do so. Um, that's what I'd say. That's the definition of arrest publica, right? So, yes, should it be put to a, a state vote? I have no problem there. I, don't, I wouldn't call that tyranny. And, and you're also against um, Aristotle, Thomas, Suarez, even a bunch of the Salamanca guys, when you define any minority setting a law as tyrannical that that by definition there are three good regimes right there's a rule by one rule by few rule by many all three of them are valid they all have shades where they become despotic right a a good king can become a despot that's rule by one a good aristocracy rule by few can become a an oligarchy uh when it stops ruling in favor of the common good and a and a a good rule by many republic or polity can become a democracy if they become despotic, but the distinction is not the number itself. A good king can make a law for all the people. That's just that's just that's Catholic political teaching, right? As accepted by all these Solomonkin guys, Thomas, whatever. So I think that's what we're really disagreeing on is can I mean a lot see a lot of these trad Catholics are mad at me because I'm not a, a monarchist. I'm like, well, hey man, Thomas Aquinas, Aristotle, uh, Bellarmine. They all say, they all accept Plato's distinction. There are three good regimes, right? And you can pick which one best fits. The American Republic is actually not a republic. It's Thomas Aquinas's fourth instance of mixed regime, where you have an element of kingliness at the executive power, an element of uh, aristocracy in the judiciary, right? That's ruled by the few. And you have the element of republicanism at the legislative level. Thomas Aquinas calls that the mixed regime, but... I think you misunderstood what I meant, though, because I'm not saying that, like, obviously in our society, we have 535 lawmakers who make law for 300 million. That's, that, that's not what I meant by a minority making laws for a majority. What I meant is if the, pop, the populace the population, or or at least a majority of the population, doesn't consider the the, the ruler to be legitimate, uh, doesn't consider the things that are being done, imposed on them by force to be legitimate, then that's tyranny. And so in a, in a state like California, that is probably well above 50% pro-choice, for example, when they, when they, um, if they were to, if like somehow the a Catholic got elected and said so we are banning uh, abortion. I mean, again, abortion is a bad is a is a bad example. Let's say drag queen story hour. Californians majority support drag queen story hour. If a Catholic were elected and said we're banning it, and they said, um, you know, no, we're going to pass a, a referendum saying it's allowed, and they said too bad, we're going to send the cops out to enforce the ban that you guys don't consider to be legitimate and that you de- democratically tried to overthrow or whatever. Like you you have gone into dangerous territory there. And I actually no, I the, agree there. The cr- I'm just saying I would vote for the ban. In I voted for Prop 8 in 2009 here in in California. I would vote. Um, it's inappropriate to hold a vote again. Set set abortion aside because it's such a basic human rights thing that, that we neither of us was trying to go there because we agree about it. It's sui generis insofar as we're defining. Could a family competently adjudicate this? Well, no. If they're killing their kid, 
and there's a majority of families that would kill their kid as in states like New York or, or California, then, then we have to move to something else. I'm not exactly sure what Rand Paul has some good ideas there. But yeah, something like uh, Drag Queen Story Hour still involves innocent kids. I, I like what you're saying. It's, it's the better. It's the only thing we found to really disagree about. What I wrote about in Human Events last summer was that um, that it's wholly inappropriate to even like take a national legislative tally or some special referendum at the national level outlawing dra drag queen story hour. What I said is, 10th Amendment, police power of the state, this should be done at the state level. I never claimed that, and I would lose in California, um, a, a, any New Yorker would lose, lots of, lots of us would lose. I never claimed that there's a kind of moral imperative of extra legal action at that point. Um, uh, what I told Sorab, in fact, on, on DM is, why don't you leave New York? I'm trying to leave California, right? That's, that's, um, that's voting with your feet, right? Go, go to find a, a res publica that more aptly uh, represents you. So I wasn't saying that at that point we should have civil or hot active disobedience in those states with an issue less than abortion where maybe it's necessary um, to get rid of it all, all, all across the land. Um, right. Does that, so does that make sense? I'm just saying, yeah, if they came to a vote here in California, that is the police power of the state. It's in the, the amendments. It's the original meaning of the constitution. I'd vote and I'd leave, lose, and I probably need to leave the state. What's wrong with, what's wrong with the 50 states as the four of experimentation? And you, well, I'll give you the last word, but I just think you're made, you're making a constitutional argument rather than a Catholic social teaching argument because you know that you fail on subsidiarity because it's so obvious that whatever size of the state we're dealing the with, there are there are smaller there are smaller units, like I said, counties, townships, families that could make most most decisions and on Drag Queen Story Hour, uh, that decision could be made at any of those levels and therefore to say I'm I support doing it at the state instead of one of those is a failure, on. The merits of subsidiarity that that's my argument not that you fail on constitutional grounds that you fail on catholic social teaching grounds this is a, a rare occasion for me to be able to say somebody else is not properly applying catholic social teaching rigidly oh, enough fair but enough i, think it's I mean I'll, I'll smile it all but all you're saying is my state's really really big which is true uh, and and i i like i i think i've stipulated a, a couple times here um i didn't even know it was going to be a debate but i the state's big, too big, fails uh, the Montesquieu test for what a republic would be, even if California were the whole nation. Even if we balkanized everything the way the extreme anti-federalists uh, wanted to in, in 1788 and made each state its own nation, California would be too big a nation, even, you know. And so I agree with that. But I'm just saying I'm I'm making a subsidiary argument applied to the Constitution, because as I'm always telling these post-liberals, uh, Stephanie, Catholic post-liberals, I'm like, the one way that we can get to substance is through procedure. We can't, I mean, I, I, I'm surprised to be having to defend on these grounds to you. Procedural due process is the one way we can get to substantive due process. They on the illiberal right, post-liberal right, they, they disagree. They're like, no, let's just get a, let's get a Catholic king. Let's declare Trump Catholic king or whatever. He's not even Catholic, but his wife is. So let's just have him make all these laws from the top. I don't want to do that. I'm saying um, subsidiarity does count. It's more valid uh, to assume that a state is is the proper legislating arm. And the Constitution says this. If we go back to the Tenth Amendment, we read it back into the Constitution. And I'd be all for, here, here's where I can make a concession. I've said it lots of times. I'd be all for balkanizing the state. The big states should be smaller. Texas should be five states. California should be five states. And that's how, I mean, that's why I don't fail in subsidiarity. And then those low, I agree with you, those localities should be something more like the size of my county, which is a large county, Kern County, a uh, hundred miles north of LA. It should, it should have the right to decide. I mean, there is some level where health, safety, welfare, morals, um, I guess I'm that much less a minarchist than you. You could have a, ha have a tally. And if, Drag queens really want to read to kids, and the Catholic Church does say this promotes gender dysphoria, right, which is like abuse. What we're really asking is, 
does does any level of government, even even local government, even if it's more local than a large state, have some right to tell a parent that what you're doing is deeply um, uh, malformative to the kid? And I, I'm uncomfortable saying yes, you know, because I'm not a post liberal. But at some level, you have to admit yes. Abortion is the rule proving exception that it's like this is the most malformative. This is the the parent killing the kid. What's too strange, and I guess we're we're out of time here. Um, but what's too strange is that we wake up in a day where families really are. Uh, there, there's a kind of war of all against all, mothers against their babies, you know, fathers against their kids, where at some level there is a protection needed at whatever level. Leave the the debate to the side uh, from these murderous parents against the kid or or ones that would bring them to drag queen story hour. I don't want the nation doing that. At some level, there should be authority of, of a small locality to vote and say, do this or not do this. The point is, I guess, if you're taking the part of the drag queens who want to read to kids, hypothetically, um, yeah, they could always find, there will be leftover places in the country. This is sort of a, a reverse way of looking at it for me. There will be places liberal enough to say, yeah, we want this, and they can go gravitate there. Yeah, they can vote with their feet if they want, because it shouldn't be coming from the national level. That's the one area we disagree, or we agree on here. Right, right. I, I'm, I think that probably we've said enough as we can say in one, uh, one episode. Um, I have, you know, more thoughts and questions. It's been a really interesting conversation, but I'm happy to, to let it go with that level of agreement and disagreement. Well, so for first half hour, uh, Stephanie Slade from Reason Magazine, thank you. Thank you for coming on. Um, first half hour, nothing but agreement. And then second half hour, uh, at the level of this, this infinitesimal detail, where does the state actually have, because you said you're not an anarchist, a minarchist, which is how I define myself. Where does the state actually hold that power. Um, I think we're, we're just sort of straining at gnats when it comes to uh, the scope of government where it actually holds the power. Do you have any, so you have an upcoming debate. Do you have any other uh, publications coming up soon, Stephanie, that you want to kick a shout to? Um, I am in the early process of working on a big piece about fusionism, the sort of uh, conservative libertarian coalition and, and the, the philosophy around that, but that is not uh, anywhere close to being done. So uh, in the in the near to distant future, keep an eye out for that. Otherwise, I don't have much coming soon. Cool. Uh, is that are, are you broadly in a word? Are you pro or against? Uh, I am pro. I actually yeah, in the yeah, process of, of re uh, researching this, talked myself out of being I had initially been a skeptic <laughs> of the future of fusionism as the schism on the right is sort of happening. I'm going, right. this is it. This is the end of the of the coalition and the any future for us to sort of work together. But I've talked myself back into um, believing that fusionism is a coherent philosophy that can be revived, and I'm going to do my best to try to to try to you know do my part to do to help with that. Good, I'm glad to hear that. You know, that's funny you mentioned that because last summer during all this drag queen story hour debate between French and Amari, I was like you. It sounds like I was agreeing. Oh man, I, it is just done. It's an untenable relation, and I too, in the last six months, have come back around to, no, it's actually not. It's actually not through through the through parsing through these questions like we went through uh, painstakingly uh, around minute forty five. I actually was like, no, it's it's really it's actually not. It's a tenable relation, but that that there can be such a thing as a uh, conservatarian uh, conservatarian. Again, I I'd say it, it's by parsing uh, national from more local politics, even if some states are too big, which you've pointed out today, and I agree with. Uh, anyway, Let's hear it. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. I, I, I've agreed all along that that I mean, the state of Texas is a farce as a as a lo uh, local sovereign, you know, uh, scope of government or, or the state of California. So let's man my what I argue in Catholic Republic, by the way, my, here's my last thought is break it all up, break it all up. Even Jefferson in uh what was it? I think as vice president, he wrote this. It matters not to the future of American happiness, whether we be one people or 13 peoples or four peoples. Some of the anti-federalists wanted to break it into four where the interests were more aligned, you know, cons self-consistent, north, south, middle section. Somehow there's a fourth in there, according to George Mason. But 
um, I've always been a, a Jeffersonian of that point of view. The country's so divided. I mean, people that don't agree with me and you are, are just arguing for the exact opposite thing. The future of America, I think, should lie in balkanization. Hopefully we could be friends. But um, the big states even need to be broken up. And states need to be returned to power. We can at least agree on that much, right? Yeah. States need to have more power, state legislatures, than the Congress. Yeah. I mean, I guess my final thought would be, much as great as it would be to, to break up a bunch of states into smaller states and whatnot, um, I, I actually think that devolving power to the local, like, more local levels is more realistic in terms of a, a political goal at this point. So that's, that's I think, another argument for um, not being content to, to push for lawmaking of this kind, lawmaking related to morals, regulation of morals, not, not protection of life, liberty, property, but just specifically these moral questions that are in dispute. Um, you know, it may, in, a, in a theoretical world where we had 85 states or 110 states or, you know, 1,000 states, um, probably we would have the same position in a world with 50 states and very little prospect for any more than that in, in the near future. I think localism is probably where we should be looking in terms of avenues for for improving our sort of governing uh, regime. Cool. Well, I mean, it sounds good to me. Uh, but yeah, uh, thanks a lot. Everyone check out Stephanie's work on uh, at Reason Mag. Uh, I've, she does a lot of good work there. And, you know, you're flying the flag for Catholic libertarians. And I think you're doing so with uh, much aplomb. Uh, so thanks a lot for, for doing what you do, Stephanie. Thanks for appearing on Cath Min Gov Week. And agreeing with me the first half hour and disagreeing with me the second half hour has been a lot of fun. Tomorrow we have Dr. Samuel Gregg, uh, who wrote Tea Party Patriot. And Friday we got uh, Robert R. Riley. And Saturday we have a surprise guest that I'm still not announcing even on Wednesday, home day. But uh, those are the breaks. People get over it. Uh, thank you, everyone. God bless. Please hit subscribe and like. Everyone have a great day. We'll see you tomorrow.